Um, if you all haven't met me before, uh, I am Chad at Foxhall, or otherwise known as Chad White. Um, I'm here at Barony of Flame, otherwise known as Louisville, Kentucky. Uh, so I'll apologize at first just because, so this class is gonna be different than a lot of my other classes I've given before, because my previous classes um, were usually based on research papers that are actually complete and have fun things like introductions, paragraphs, and conclusions. Uh, this is a little bit of a rambling research thing that I'm still working on in progress. So I don't actually have a paper that I'm basing this off of. This is this is a little bit of like rambling minds and thoughts and things that I'm, I'm working on. Um, I am currently in my uh, master's program at UofL. Uh, I'm but accepted to and entering the PhD program. So this is kind of like my PhD research connected to that, uh, where I'm looking at um, medievalism and reception of medieval history and, and, and how people understand it. So that's where this is coming from as an example. Um, so it, it's one of the things, like, it, it, no, no story is truly told in, 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 in such a very closed idea of like Victorians and Vikings, because there's 10,000, points of factors leading up to, uh, and I can't obviously cover all of those. As my supervisors well know, in, in, the, in academia, I like to talk about all the things and they try to limit me down to those type of things. So let me go on to share my screen now that we've had that introduction and see if we can make this work for me. Also, is there anyone who wants to volunteer to yell at me when I start talking fast? Because I get excited and talking very fast, it's hard to understand. And since I can't see you on my screen, I'll need you to unmute and yell at me about that. I can yell at you, Chad. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. And it, it has become necessary in my last class, so don't feel free. So one of the things we're looking at here is the Viking Age. And if you actually like look at things like on Wikipedia, you can find the Viking Age, and there's a, there's a page about that. But you know, the idea of Victorian Age, Viking Age, it's kind of a modern concept. Historians love to categorize things. We know in reality things are far more nebulous than that. One of the things we talk about is like, what is a Victorian? Well, technically a Victorian is a British subject under the rule of Queen Victoria from 1837 to 1901. Now, Americans also like to consider themselves to be Victorians even though they were under that rule. For instance, I live in Old Louisville, which is the largest intact Victorian neighborhood in the country. So my house is built 18, 1890, all the houses around me are done the same way. Were we Victorian or Victorian style? That's questionable. Things we talk about in, in this type of research isn't necessarily going to be British and or American people. We're talking about Norwegians and Germans and all kinds of things that were still in this time period, but not of the Victorian people, if you want to call it that. Now, the same thing with Vikings. Fairly certain that most people in this room understand the word Viking is actually closer related to like pirate. You know, there wasn't a Viking unified culture, you know, the, you know but it, it's become shorthand that the Vikings, Viking culture, Viking people uh, it is kind of shorthand for Scandinavians or Nordic culture, you know, those type of things. Um, the fun part about this is the fact that in the period we're talking about, people then couldn't agree what we'd call these terms. So we still got it wrong 150 years later. We still can't figure out a single term that encompasses all these things. So it, it, it kind of works out that way. I mean, the, it, one of the things I point out is like, the word Viking wasn't even in the Oxford English Dictionary until 1807. So it was, it was not in English language by that point. Um, but you know, you call it the early medieval period, you call it whatever. I have a, a, peeve, a pet peeve about language because people talk about medieval history, medieval period, when it needs a little more categorization that it's usually we talk about like in the essay, it's generally European medieval history, not just medieval history. There were other places. So, um, so in the area we're talking about, the, this Victorian era or nebulous thereof, you know, to forgive me for the shorthand and the fact that I love alliteration, hence Victorians and Vikings. Um, it's not as if, the English in general, especially the academics and, and, and the Victorian period, were unaware of what we think of as the Viking Age today. They, they knew it existed, they knew it was there, they thought of it in different ways, uh, they understood it in different ways. Two of the kings in the English litany were Viking kings. You know, you've got Sven Borkbeard and Canute, or Canute the Great, were both kings of England, Sven being the dad, Canute being the son. They were also kings of other places, and actually one of the other fun arguments academics love to have is they, they sometimes refer to this as the North Sea Empire. So, but you know, there were 
an empire like Victoria was an empress means it ruled from one place where Canute and Sven kind of like were kings of different places at multiple places at the same time and not necessarily emperors in the same way. Um, so they, they weren't ignorant of this thing. They just, it, it, there were a lot of things that were happening in this time period in the 1800s and 1900s that kind of led up to this surge of interest so much in, in, in the Viking period that we, we, we talk about. Sorry, I've been talking a lot today and I'm skipping through my notes. So let me. <laughs> um, so, when academics get a hold of this stuff, when it starts to become of interest um, to the world at large, we're dealing with a time when literacy rates were increasing and, and you know, people were finding new routes of interest. And one of them was this Viking period. But they, even then, like we're saying, they can't, you couldn't even agree what to call it. So even the spelling of the word Viking was debated for over. You know, the, you know and I've got a list of the ones that were being used at the time and why they were being used. So, because obviously if you, if you speak any German or um, Old Norse or any of those Germanic languages, you know how the V and the W sound swap around and you know, you know, instead of saying Wagner, you say Wagner. So the same thing with like Viking and Viking. And, and if they're basing this stuff off the Old English and how the Old English was being spelled, is it a V, is it a W? So they couldn't even decide on the word, which kind of shows that this is new territory for a lot of people and they couldn't really put it. You know, also the idea of, of a Viking you know, sounded great to a uh, Victorian English person because it's like sea king, Viking, that made sense to them. Or was the vague part of slaughter? Or was it Vic because of bay and sea? I mean, this is how undecided they were about where to even start on, in some of this research. But some of the stuff that was happening is there was this new interest going on. And a lot of it was based on romanticism. And the time period that's happening is kind of, we think of it as a romantic movement. So you've got um, artists and poets and, and musicians and everything else and architects, and they're, they're leaning into this new idea of uh, romanticism, which it, it, it's talking about um, you know, emotion and individualism. Uh, they're idealizing nature. They're suspicious of science. We are, we're moving into the industrial, we have the industrial era happening and, and massive urbanization happening. And so what always happens with these, with these when, when, if there are history, when these movements happen, is people like start feeling nostalgic about the past in that sense. And, and that, that nature is where it's, where it's at and, and this is how we should be. It's basically a hippie movement of the 1800s. So if you think of it that way. So it, it's, you know, this is, this is what's happening. You also, like I said, the, the uh, literacy rate is increasing. Uh, actually I actually had a, a point, around 1800 in England, 40% of males and 60% of females were illiterate. A century later, it was less than 3%. So you have more access to newspapers, more access to books, people are able to read. So people are publishing things. And what they're publishing because of romanticism are these great fantastical heroic stories that people like to read. But, um, and more people are getting educations at the same time. Um, you know, people have, have access to these things. One of my favorites, um, Joseph Wright, uh, who 1855 to 1930, he was actually J.R.R. Tolkien's mentor at Oxford. Joseph couldn't read a word till he was 15 years old. He grew up um, up in, in Yorkshire. The father, uh, his father was a weaver. Um, so, and, and I think he worked, he worked in um, a stone quarry as well as a quarryman. So, but he taught himself how to read. He taught himself how to read Greek, Latin, German, Old English, Old Norse, and actually became uh, Tolkien's mentor in that sense. So and he, his story is not alone. This that you have people who are reaching back to this past to try to find some kind of meaning in it. Um, so you see it in architecture, like this is the um, pavilion of Brighton. Um, you see it in fashion. You know, this dress, and I'm not a dress historian, uh, but this dress is supposed to be based off of medieval examples. So this is what they considered to be a medieval sleeve at the time. And of course, you've got uh, um, Oscar Wilde and his crazy fashions that dip into all kinds of historic periods at the time. You know, you've got artwork and paintings. And this is from a series of paintings in New York that are one of my favorites. In the course of empire, it shows the same landscape through cave time people with like a Stonehenge thing going on up to like this beautiful Roman empire to the destruction of it. And like the next series of paintings is the same landscape all overgrown and portrayed in the 1800s. So, you know, people had this concept of the past that they were trying to, to, to deal with. Um, you know, 
pre-Raphaelite paintings and, and those type of things. Of course, this is one of the popular eras. Uh, I think 90% of Skadians have the, the accolade painting there, the center of my slide, somewhere in their house. Um, I've, I've seen that quite a lot. But you know, so not only the medieval period, but the Viking period became a big thing too. And one of the reasons they were reaching into this Viking period was it was it was a little more alien to them. You know, the medieval period was Christian, they were Christian, they, they saw themselves in that, where the Viking period of the sagas were, were thought to be something from a pre-Christian time period before Christianity erased it all. And, and so they they were they're fascinated with that, that othering concept of it. Um, one of my favorites, William Morris, of course, used a lot of uh, uh, medieval motifs as well. Um, not necessarily Viking stuff, but you know they, they were in there. So it was in every aspect of these people's lives where they were doing. Now, this, this fascination uh, of the Romantic period and all that um, was interesting enough, but it also kind of led to Romantic nationalism, uh, which has its own problems. <laughs> uh, so people were trying to attempt to craft and, and design um, national identities at this time. You have to see, understand that a lot of states were still forming to what we think of them today. Um, for 400 years, Norway had not been independent. Um, you know, they, they, were developed, they developed their own independency in the 1800s, uh, 1814 ish, I think it is. Um, but, and so they were trying to craft these things. So like this picture on the left you see with the boat is supposed to be a, a folk image of a wedding happening on, you know, uh, in one of the fjords. And then one on the right is, of course, uh, Manifest Destiny, because the Americans were doing this at the same time. They were trying to create this American identity. Germans were doing it, Brits were doing it, Norwegians were doing it. Um, at one point, Iceland tried to sell themselves to England um, for an island. They were trying to trade some kind of island thing too, because they thought there were more connections between Iceland and England, and they thought it might do really well. That's a whole other story that I'm not going to get into. Um, but in, in the area previous to this, there were a lot of connections drawn from the classical past. People were kind of ignoring the medieval past as what it was, the Dark Ages, the concept of the Dark Ages happening at this time. And they were drawing like Rome and Greece and marble and philosophy and, and civilization. And that became kind of cold and sterile in this romantic period. So they moved more into this idea of the medieval period and the, and the Viking area being a little more emotional you know, a lot of the stories, if you read the sagas, have a lot of emotion in them. The same with the Anglo-Saxon poetry. I gave a class and I've written a paper, I'm actually working to get it published academically, on how um, the old English poem, The Wanderer, actually deals with trauma, post-traumatic stress disorder, and survivor's guilt in the Anglo-Saxon period, because you have this guy wandering the beach, he's the last of his war band who survived, and he wants to kill himself because of it. So, so there's a lot of emotion in there. Uh, and this example, one of my favorite ones in Germany, because it just it's, it's wild. Um, so this is built in the late 1800s. This is called Walhalla. So based on the Viking idea of the afterlife, Walhalla is built in Bavaria as a Greek temple to honor the great people of Germany. And it is it sits on this um, yeah. Beautiful, beautiful cliffside over a river, and it's full of these busts of people done in a Roman style, but it's all got these German, Nordic, Viking style names of people and all this. Um, and they were trying to show like how permanent and great Germany is and, and, and create a monument to their culture. Um, so again, we, we get this idea of they're, they're mixing this classical imagery with, the, with this uh, you know, early medieval period, Viking period stuff. And it, it, it's a little bizarre. And someday I hope to really travel to this place. So um, there's a whole history that's mixed in with this, with the whole Nazi regime. Um, and then the, 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 the modern history where they actually have now included um, busts of black German women and other things that have, have, have made contra contributions to the society at this point are, are now involved in this. So it, it's, it's just bizarre. It's weird. The whole nationalist movement of the thing. But, um, you know, people are trying to you know develop the you know these the create and actually outline what their shared values are um, and what their collected cultural mythology is going to be. Um, so that's one of the reasons why the Viking Age was created at this time because they want to outline these medieval periods, um, which where you get the first Reich, the second Reich, the third Reich. You know, you, you get the, you know people are defining like oh Henry Fowler 
we're going to call him the first king of Germany, even though Germany wasn't technically a thing the way it was in the 20th century, they were, they decided to backdate him and call him the, the first Reich. Um, or if you ask somebody else, it was, it was Charlemagne. Charlemagne was the first German king because Franks were technically, were kind of sort of technically Germans at the time. So maybe Charlemagne's empire, which lasted nearly a thousand years, was, was going to be the first Reich. Um, these are the remains of the first Viking ship found in Norway. Um, I have it in here somewhere in my notes. Um, but you know, and, and this kind of spur an idea, and, and this romantic idea of the past spurred on a lot of ideas like, oh, so we, we should start looking at some of the stuff we have, you know, previous to this archaeologists were usually a bunch of rich white men who had the time to hire someone to dig something up. And then they have it, it's like, oh, this is kind of cool. And they'll put it in their cabinet of curiosity and, and you know, display it to the room to their friends. Then we get museums later on, and then we get scientific archaeology later on. But you know, for a while, you know, from the from 1800 up until you know 1950, you know 1910, 1950s, people were just opening up burial mounds to look for really cool stuff and, and worry about it. So this is the the Sutton Hoo um, burial in England, which originally they thought was going to be a Viking longship. It turned out to be older than that. Turned out to be more Anglo-Saxon. So, um, but I mean, it was a major attraction and we're and by now we're talking we're almost into the uh, world war ii at this point um and we're, we're, some of this stuff is going on uh, world war one world war ii in, in those eras but you know they were looking everywhere to find this stuff and dig it up and, and the reasoning why is they were trying to again craft that national identity and, and connect to it and somehow same thing is happening in america um and, and uh was it Mid 1800s or, or what it was 1867. 1867, we had a, a scholar up in Wisconsin, Rasmus B. Anderson, who created the first department for Scandinavian studies, who floated the first ideas that we have written down that uh, the stories of Vinland were true, that Vikings did visit North America. Um, he eventually became an ambassador to Norway. So, but he is also helping to craft that identity in the Victorian period that the Viking Age was a thing and that. These are those connections and these identities that we can draw to it, it, it and all that. Um, the the Kurdo Horde discovered in 1840 in Lancashire. Oh, I spelled Lancashire wrong and Hillary is going to get me for that one. Um, <laughs> uh, you know, huge silver hordes and, and, and things were going around. But, um, but like I said, they weren't, they weren't ignorant to it, but it did become very popular in that sense. So the, um, at the time, there were a lot of books written about the, in the Victorians. Some of the, the great ones, um, the more popular ones, I've listed here on the slide, the Victorians were writing about it. A lot of them were Victorian translations of the sagas, which today aren't great um, for the most part. A lot of- uh, uh, Chad, I, I, real I, quick, I, you've, got a, you've got a question in the chat. I don't know if you had the chat open so you could see it. I don't know, uh, can, I, can I see my okay. chat? Uh, yeah, you had, for the Victorians yes. aware of the sagas, written yep. down by Snorri, which they which he was like, wait, it's on this slide, we're good. Yeah, I actually had somewhere in my notes and I may have skipped over about the uh, the first sagas. I mean, there were sagas translated into Latin in the 1500s. So it's like they, they, they knew about them. It's like, I think it was 1515 was one of the first times one of the sagas was translated um, into Latin, which obviously was the academic language at the time. Um, and, then, and then later on as well. Um, I work myself from a lot of Victorian translations of things and the Victorians like to add a lot of things that weren't actually there in the original text. They make things very, very flowery. Um, I have about 10 different versions of Beowulf on my bookshelf um, from, from all different time periods, including a modern one, which uses curse words, which is hilarious. It's a feminist reading of Beowulf, it's hilarious. Um, but it, it's, so they were aware of a lot of these. You know, it, one of the most famous ones is always Burton Yell. Um, you, you've got Burton Yall and, and Heimskriga and, and, and all of these different sagas, um, which are great for a lot of stories. They, they really are. They, they, they give you a lot and they, they are fascinating. A lot of times in the Victorian period, what they thought of as the Vikings in these sagas, they kind of looked at these things as kind of not only romantic, but heroic journey. So, you know, today a lot of people might consider the Vikings and the Viking raids to be uh, you know, the bloodthirsty heathens attacking the Christians and, and the warriors, especially if you look at the very modern bad TV show of Vikings and their leather and their weird haircuts and 
like you no, know, the Vikings were just bloodthirsty beasts, and they did all this stuff and had threesomes and stuff. It's like the Romantics and the Victorians thought of it a lot differently than that. And in my opinion, neither of them were quite correct 100%. We're not even sure everything 100%. So, um, but so this is where a lot of our history comes from, though. And this is the history that gets passed down to us, the understanding of the Viking period. Um, a lot of it starts here. You know, you know, but prior to this period, a lot of the stuff was limited to pure academics, living in an academy, um, working from a Christian perspective, um, and, and they were writing these things down and bringing these things to us. But by we get to the time where literacy rates have increased in the Victorian era, it becomes popular. And we, we get a lot of popular interpretations of these things. We get the, the, uh, the Wagner operas. We get products called the Norsemen, you know, selling cigarettes and tobacco. We, you know, the labels are, are everything. And so the, the understanding changes. Um, and so, of course, one of the famous misunderstandings uh, with Wagner is the idea of horned helmets. And these two helmets are, are two different versions. Um, one's found in Germany, one's found in the Thames outside of London. Um, one, you know, it's from the, the almost up to the, uh, from the Roman occupation of Britain. So, we're, you know, we're dealing like the, the years 100s, I think. The other one's from uh, long after that. But these are what were sitting in people's cabinets or people's museums. And they thought, well, this must be Viking. If I've dug up a sword in my backyard, it's probably Viking. You know, this is what people were, were, were thinking and publishing at the time, which isn't necessarily true. Um, and, and people are misinterpreting that all the time. So in the Wagner operas and the other operas, you get these a lot of weird mixed costume things are happening. It's like you've got Roman shields with feathered helmets and you know, and, and all kinds of things like that happening at the same time, and, and big conical breastplates on women warriors as Valkyries and and, and, you know, but opera was the popular medium for, for a lot of these, especially the wealthy elite who were going out to hear these things and see these things. Also, you got, you know, where's this other, other idea where the horn helmets might be coming from is a lot of these images, which a lot of them are actually Anglo-Saxon, not what we consider Viking, Danish, Norse in any sense. Some of them are, some of them are Odin, some of them are. But you've got this shape on top of which we are assuming is an Odin or warrior type figure. It's either Berserk or Odin. But if you look at like this one, that's all rusty enough. It's like, that's just kind of weird shapes. But you look at this one, like those are birds. And if those are birds and there's two of them over a guy's head, well, maybe that's Hugin and Mugen from, from Odin. And maybe that's what that is. Um, and this is, this is kind of bear warrior thing. So Berserker, there's, there's our thing there. So we're, we're trying to understand what those means. And we're looking at a very, time period of a nascent understanding of the Viking period, what we consider the Viking period. As I said before, one of my pet peeves and one of the things I, I get on about is the Viking Age. When you look at the Viking Age, when you look up at Wikipedia anywhere else, it gives the date 793 to 1066. Anyone want to say what happened in 793 in England? Anyone want to, want to volunteer that answer? About the raid on the Abbey. Uh, Linda's farm, 793. Yeah. And 1066 was Battle of Stamford Bridge and Battle of, ha Battle of Hastings. So we got our first Viking raid and our last Viking raid. That's how it's categorized usually in British history, which is wrong. Um, actually, the, the first attack by Vikings, by, by Danish warriors uh, on English settlement was a few years before 793, at least 787, possibly. There's actually a recording in the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle that talks about uh, I'll read it for you. <clears throat> Excuse me. This year, King Betric took Edberga, the daughter of Offa, to wife. And in his days came first three ships from the Northmen from the lands of robbers. The Reeve then rode thereto and would drive them to the king's town, for he knew what, not what they were, and there he was slain. These were the first ships of the Danish men that sought the land of the English nation. Now, that's, the, that's one of the entries from one of the copies of the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle, which is one of our best sources for these type of histories. So there's other ones that talk about it that they were caused with traitors because there were Danish traitors in coming from Denmark and Norway, possibly into uh, England to Britain long before Lindisfarne. And they, they were known. But for some reason, someday this guy decided to attack him and kill him. Maybe he didn't want to pay his bill. But, you know, 
That is what a lot of people would consider today to be the actual first Viking attack on England, you know, years before Lindisfarne. Lindisfarne is the notable one. It's the one that made all the all the letters and and and, and stuff at the time. You know, uh, you've got records of Alcuin talking about it to Charlemagne. Uh, this monastery has been destroyed by these crazy men. So, um, and then again, the other end of it is the Battle of Stamford Bridge, when Harold Hardrada uh, with Tostig is fighting Harold Godwinson. Um, Harold Godwinson defeats them and then has to haul ass down to Hastings to fight to go fight off William Normandy and then fails them. So, um, so we, we get those two things, and that's what we consider the Viking Age. Because we're Americans, and basically everything we do is linked to Britain and to England, that's what we consider it. But outside of England, they don't consider it the Viking Age in that sense. To me, it's the early medieval period or the late Iron Age. A friend of mine is at uh, Uppsala University in Sweden. And you know they would never call this the Viking Age. They would call this the late Iron Age or the early medieval period. Um, and she's working on archeology span and temples and stuff there. So it's a very British Anglo-centric view uh, of what that period is. And again, that's what we would get this from the Victorians who are doing a lot of our writing at the time that has come down to us, especially as Americans or Brits. Um, great romantic imagery of Harold Hardrada taking an arrow to the neck right there. I love that one. Um, clearly the uh, costumes are not quite medieval and appropriate. So I, I love that one. Uh, Grimmer, yes, the Victorians also kind of gave us this romanticized Boy Scout version of the medieval knight, that's in the chat. Um, so you, you, you get a lot of, of that as well, where you know, the idea of Arthurian romance comes to us in the, in the Victorian period as a, as a popular form of entertainment. So uh, I'm concluding on my, one of my favorite Viking images of all time. So uh, my husband loves this one. He was singing it to me last night. Um, so, but I do love how accurate he got them to the Wagner stuff. So this is my, my, probably my earliest introduction as a kid to the Wagner operas and to the Viking imagery was our horned helmet and feathered Valkyrie helmet here. So let me stop my share so we can talk. So, so that's kind of where my research is at this point and, and, and stuff I was, I've been looking at in this sense and how the Victorians for a great greater part have invented the Viking age as we understand it today. And that's where a lot of our reception is coming from. Um, and yes, Mallory was already propagating a lot of the earth romance, but again, with the idea of literacy and um, everything increasing in this Victorian period, it became super popular. It's, you know, these are just some of the images that, uh, that people are looking at. And, you know, I mean, Arthur has been a popular figure throughout the late medieval period already. I love the Glastonbury Abbey, where at one point, I think it was the 1200s, they were running out of money. And so they, discovered King Arthur's grave in, on the Abbey grounds and became a tourist attraction. So, and suddenly had a lot more money. So, you know, people are not above that. That's, that's a great thing. There's, there's still, if you go there today, there's still an interpreter in this Victorian idea of medieval clothing walking around to tell you about King Arthur. So lots and lots of drapery and flowing layers of things. And it's, it's it, it hasn't stopped, it's still going on. So, so that's where I am with, with this. Who wants to talk about it? Please feel free. <laughs> Promise he, he doesn't bite her computer screen. <laughs> uh, yeah. I'm here if you all have questions or comments. Um, I don't have anything to share document-wise like I did with my last class. In my last class, I actually uploaded the full paper to the uh, Google Drive they're using here for the Rome, which is on, on the uh, Roman grave. Um, someday soon, uh, I'll have papers on this, but not today, sadly. So, right. I've got a question. Um, Go, Thora. You're quiet, by the way. OK. Um, is there anything that you know of that the Victorians kind of made up, but then we later figured out that, oh, well, maybe they were right about this. Nothing I know of in particular, especially when it comes to like saga translations, which I generally work in more of a literary format than like archaeology or something. Um, most of the archaeology, I'd say 
60, 70 percent they probably got wrong the first go around. <laughs> We've discovered more. Um, the problem is with, with a lot of that is things when they try to fix things. Um, you know, you, you've seen interpretations of various helmets and things. There's only been one attacked Viking helmet ever actually found in Norway. Um, people try to make things up and, and, and fraud, you know, committing fraud is a lifelong passion of, uh, of people through centuries. So um, that's a thing that happens. But I don't know there's anything that we thought they got wrong that is now we've gotten right that I'm aware of. What would you say is the most um, accurate or closest to the Viking sagas translated today? Like who wrote those? Because I would like to read them. I'm a friend of Jackson Crawford. I think Jackson Crawford has done a really well, good job of actually documenting his translation process um, and, and letting people know why he chose basically each and every word that he's chosen. So I, I've read a few of his. I've read the Edda, uh, his Edda translation. Um, I think I have it in my other bookcase. I, I have two bookcases. I have one here and one at my, my actual office at work. Okay. But Jackson Crawford is the one I look to the most on that one. Okay, thanks. So uh, could you talk more about the about the horned helmets and how they what they're actually what those like the ones you showed the pictures of what they actually were? So the, the, the actual physical objects that were found um, were most likely ritualized objects for uh, Celtic people. So, okay. so I think, think more, much more related to like the Druid religions than, than anything else. Um, usually they're made of precious metal. So they're not very good for things like combat if they're made of gold, but gold is soft. Um, and also the horns would get in the way. So, uh, it, it was inspiration for the Loki helmet in the, in the uh, MCU universe, uh, Marvel universe. Uh, you see that the curled horns that go up like that. Um, but no, they were probably ritual objects that signified probably some chief religious person. Uh, the one uh, that was found in England was actually found in the Thames, uh, right outside, inside of, outside of London. So, but people found them and thought Vikings because basically everything they found during that time period they thought Vikings. Unless it was stamped with the Roman Emperor's face, they, they assumed it was a Viking thing, so. Okay. Thank you, thank you. Well, I remember hearing about uh, a fake saga that was uh, written, produced at this time. Uh, do you I, I, I read something briefly about it, but I can't recall basically any de details at this moment. <laughs> Yeah, no, it's I'm remembering it from another medieval class talking about uh, yeah uh, the different like epic poet pe epic poetry that countries are making in this flurry of nationalism, and uh, they talked about how there was one fake one in England, and I was wondering if you knew more about that or could talk more about it. No, that, that actually would be a fascinating uh, uh, train of thought on that one, and I. I... I remember briefly hearing about it several years ago and I've not, I've forgotten about it till just now. So you've reminded me of that. And I think I might track that down because that would be a great one to actually look into. But I, I know at the time, a lot of authors were doing, were trying to imitate the sagas in their own ways. Not, not necessarily trying to make an actual fraudulent one, but we're writing the same way. The same way that, um, um, where are you? Woodworth. Uh, Longfellow, sorry. Longfellow wrote Evangeline um based off of like the Iliad and the Odyssey he's trying to write in that, that classical parameter and writing that uh fun fact Evangeline uh the Rene LeBlanc mentioned it is my seventh great grandfather directly so uh I, I found that out not too long ago so you know because my family came from Nova Scotia and this is about the Acadian uh, diaspora so but uh, I'm not a huge poetry person I've read the sagas I've, I've, I've mostly worked on translations of them um, but it's, I, I just, I've never gotten into like understanding the meters and things like, things like that. My, my, my brain doesn't want to go there quite yet. Yes, um, Catherine says, as Ibn Fadon was a chronological meeting of Vikings as well. So um, he, he was, and his encounter was more likely uh, to the Rus Vikings, so we're way off in the East. Um, and so, where the where those societies it, you know, things like people think of the Vikings, 
Vikings not being a universal culture as well. So what was happening in Iceland was, was different than what was happening over in Russia or Norway or Sicily when they got down there or, you know, like that. But, you know, our, the, the, the people we think of as Vikings too were pretty well traveled. Um, Harold Taldrada, who fought in York, um, at Stanford Bridge, um, had served in Constantinople too. So there's that. <laughs> um, but, you know, and people didn't quite understand that too. I mean, it, leading from the Victorians into the 20th century, um, part of my big research this semester, this is what my master's thesis is on, is how the Nazis viewed their Viking and Nordic ancestry and history and, and how they used it and manipulated it and purposely misused it. Um, so it, 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 a lot of that is like, you know, they're trying to find Atlantis because they thought the Aryans came from there and it, it's weird. Um, yeah, and so they would take, Oh yeah, no, it, it's, Indiana Jones doesn't even touch on those type of stuff. So, Baron Alcar, remember the movie Vikings versus Mongols? That one I've never seen. I've never seen that one or the, was it Pathfinder where the Vikings are fighting Native Americans in weird things? Anyway, um, but yeah. <laughs> uh, anybody else, comments, thoughts, concerns? Queries? I have a query, I suppose. Yes, you mentioned it. Um, so when you, as you've looked at all of this and seen how the Victorians have shaped the modern understanding of the Viking Age, how does that affect your decisions regarding your kit and presentation within the SCA? I, I think most of my kit and presentation of the SCA has been based mostly off of archaeological finds. I kind of focused as much as I could because uh, I love the city of York, so I focus on things that have actually been found in York. Um, or I go for very generalized things for the most part. So, um, you know, null binding has existed in York because it's a sock. So if there's a sock, there must have been mittens. If there's a mittens, there must have been a hat. Um, though none of those things have been, have been found, but have been depicted on stone, bone, and wood carvings. So um, of what the Victorians thought and how their images are, I would say I summarily dismiss almost everything they put up as what a Viking looked like. I mean, they couldn't even get Canute right. There's images of Canute looking more like Ju Julius Caesar in, in the um, Victorian period with a big, long, hooked nose and clean-shaven chin. And, and, and yes, beards were, were faddish and they came and they went and Vikings shaved, Vikings didn't shave. It depends on the century, the decade. But um, I'd say pretty much almost every image the, the Victorians have put out that I have come across is wrong <laughs> and I wouldn't base much of my, my stuff off it. But you can see where their information and their depictions feed down the line into the early 20th century um, through the Art Nouveau movement and the Arts and Crafts movement um, up to the, the, the mid-century part Viking period, right up until we get to Tolkien and the beginning of the SCA and how they looked at things that were fantasy, medieval, you know, and, and, and Viking at that time period and, and the things we, we've learned since then. Will you be continuing to offer us what you are able to learn and, and um, uh, kind of solidify? I, I would love to, yes. So um, I'm finishing my MA this semester, um, work, uh, obviously like my focus in my PhD, it's been accepted, I am looking at uh, the understanding of medieval and Viking history, medievalism, um, from the Romantic National Period up until today. Uh, including that is a lot of the, the bad stuff, uh, the white supremacy stuff and the reasons and motivations why people are doing what they are. Uh, mm -hmm. In my today period, I'm looking at like Charlottesville in 2017, the United the Right Rally and how people marched with the Viking shield and what people today, especially in popular entertainment, consider to be the Viking look. You know, the long hair on top with the shaved sides and the tattoos and the coal eye makeup and, 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 you know, that. One of the great things I look at, too, is, you know, in archaeology and history, we're looking at a lot of how women are portrayed in, in the Viking period. We're looking for those, those gaps in knowledge. Um, it's been very popular now, the, the idea of the woman warrior, the, the, um, uh, the Valkyrie, and were there women on these long ships fighting battles? There had been women in graves in, in, in and near Viking battlefields who had been buried with weapons. Um, there's a great scholar. Um, 
She's an Icelandic name. I can't think of it right now. She just wrote a book called Valkyrie, uh, where it talks about this, where she doesn't call them women warriors. She calls them women buried with swords. Because as I said in my last class, people don't bury themselves. And what goes into a grave always depends on the motivation of the people who are actually digging that grave and burying that person. So uh, unless you see you know, some evidence that, uh, like we do with the English longbow man of the Hundred Years' War, who had the, the weird musculature going on and the bone deformations for, for the fighting, unless you see that same kind of evidence in the skeleton that happens to be a woman in this grave with weapons, we don't know that she's a warrior. You know, if, if my husband died, I might bury him today with something that I felt was precious. So, you know, the, is that the same kinds of motivation we're looking at in the graves we see where there's a woman who's been buried with a sword? So, not saying it didn't happen. There's sagas that talk about women fighting. That, that was a thing. So, but, you know, what are we actually looking at in the physical evidence versus the literary evidence? Is the literary being fantastical? Because the sagas are very fantastical. There's a great translation. Was it Bert Nial who crawls from the pile of bones inside the hall and pieces himself back together? It's, it's a thing. So, um, yeah. So uh, Ross is asking, there are historical writings about women fighting. I think some of the sagas I've, I've come across where women, Valkyries, someone has, has, has picked up that sword and, and, and done some fighting or, or some kind. Um, the problem with that too, again, this goes back to the historical part of the Victorian period, is not only were the sagas written down, they were written down by Christians who were writing about their historical past up to 300 years ago. Um, and so they had their motivations. Um, and then the Victorians who were doing those translations, they had their motivations. There's actually, there's something I came across recently that was doing a translation of, of, of a Latin book. And the, and the section of the book he was translating was on fornication. And he just put, we decided not to translate this due to propriety and just left it out. It's like, that's where you want to travel. If, if I could travel back in time, it would just be to slap people like that. So. Well, anything else? Any other questions, thoughts? So one, one thing, um, so I recently saw something on Beowulf and Grendel, and mm -hmm. there was an implication that um, the reason, you know, trying to change like the LBTQ, like, really put it into history that Grendel was actually a gay man and that's why they had problems he had problems in the meat hall which I thought was different but I think it is an effort to say hey we've always been here and I I'm, I think I'm all about that but I just worry that we kind of pull that thread so hard that we disjoint the entire story so I mean that's the kind of stuff that I hope we look at and say is this really what it, they were implying does that make sense that, that doesn't make sense I haven't heard that one um that would that yeah. would be interesting and I don't know if I agree with that I prefer to think of um, um, Grendel and Beowulf as uh, the Grinch who stole Christmas. You know, it, it, yeah. So yeah, that kind of thing. So um, you know, he's annoyed by the sound, so he goes and attacks them. Oh, the uh, movie with Russell Crowe is really bad, so we won't go there. Uh, one of the things I do I talk about, like queer history, especially involved with Viking history. Mm -hmm. uh, actually, a good friend of mine over in England, she wrote her, her thesis on uh, Odin as a queer figure. Okay. He gets involved in uh, practicing women's magic. And wearing women's clothing and living in a, uh, living as a woman. Oh, uh, neat! One of the sides. Yeah, and, Loki uh, is also commonly in modern culture considered to be a queer deity. Yes. Yeah, Loki. Loki is, comes across. You know, he, he transforms. Not only does he transform into a horse, he transforms into a female horse, gets pregnant, and mm -hmm. gives birth. Exactly. Um, the idea of Thor dressing up in a wedding dress to go get his hammer back to fool somebody and miss a mm -hmm. contract, uh, which people look at today. Uh, at, most people have looked at up to today as. He was, it was an embarrassing thing to dress as a woman or something like that, but it wasn't necessarily the same thing because again, this was written down by Christian people and reinterpreted right. in that sense. Um, right, and know, I thought that was interesting the way that they started bringing that out because to me, I've never thought of that. And honestly, I, I think that it's a pretty big step and I would worry that, you know, much like a lot of the things you're talking about with the horn, the Viking horned helmets, we know that's not true or they would have been like struck down in battle. But um, it's just it's just curious how people pull a thread and it becomes their philosophy. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. No, no, I do agree. And I, I think, you know, if you think about the side, especially the story of Thor and his hammer trying to get his hammer back to his woman, it's hilarious. And that's what storytelling is. 
you know, you can totally picture someone, you know, I can picture his majesty Ula sitting around a campfire, drinking his <laughs> meat horn, telling that story and getting you know, for laughs. That is, that is what that story is. You know, it wasn't, you know, condemning or calling women bad, but it's, you know, Thor is the big bad best warrior who could drink a horn that's actually tied to the sea and drop the sea level. And now he's wearing a woman's dress to get his, his precious hammer back. Mm. So. Mm -mm. I, I want to thank you. I think this has been a lot of good information and I like the fact that you are definitely passionate about it and you definitely have a broad range of things to to back up your concept. So I really and you want to thank you for that and I hope to see more of your uh, presentations. I, I hope this was somewhat coherent from my, my ramblings of my, uh, my nascent research into this. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, generally, I have something a little more you know, polished, but you know, I wanted to offer this because this has been on my mind a lot lately. I've been, I've been working on it. It's like, let's show the <laughs> Definitely. We appreciate it. Are there any more questions at all? Yes. Um, I wanted to ask, like, how you distinguish between Anglo-Saxon, Viking, Norman, is it just like a time period thing? Because at least in my head, I think of like, we have Beowulf, which is an Anglo-Saxon saga, but it also gets into this Viking, or at least it seems so strongly associated with Viking yeah. culture. And so I'm just curious how you, like you, you seem to draw a distinction between them and I'm curious how you do that. So the, the uh, Beowulf as an Anglo-Saxon poem, um, as far as we know, is written down around the ninth century or so. Uh, but the image it describes and the language it used are not associated with um, um, a lot of Danish context. The, the images, it's talking about the gates, which is over, we're dealing with Denmark, and it's not mentioning any English stuff at all. So it's probably a story that's been passed down from the period when the Anglo-Saxons were still over in Denmark and or Germany and the continent. Um, but the language they use is ninth century um, uh, or eight, uh, eighth and ninth century Anglo-Saxon without the loan words we get from the Danish Dane law invasion from 793 on. So the same thing with like the wanderer and, and things in the Exeter book, the way they're written down, it's missing what we'd expect to be there. If it's written down in the 900s, it's missing the, the Danish words because those societies were mingled at the time. So it was probably written down or told before and just copied until we get it in the Exeter book. Yes. So, but the, the, the societies, the, the, the Viking society, the, the, the Danish, Nordic, Scandinavian, and the Anglo-Saxons, were side by side and then eventually mixed when uh, they invaded and downloaded and, and that type of stuff. And that's a whole other story involved in that. So, but if you're looking at the actual literature, um, there are scholars far smarter than me that I've, wor uh, I've worked on that break down the dialect and the language and the dating and material and when it's used to try to delineate when those time periods and when those cultures exist, so. I don't hope that made sense. Okay, so we are about 10 minutes to facilitator. You're muted. Thank you, You're Thank muted. you for the class. Thank you. All right. All right. Any further, any last minute questions? Well, okay. thank you all for listening to my ramblings. I appreciate it. Absolutely. Thank I'm going to stop the recording. Thank you very much. <laughs>